good morning and welcome to the third in a series of buyer webinars. My name is Dara Sharif. I'm a managing partner with Benchmark International and I run our East Coast transaction team out of sunny Tampa, Florida. This episode will be casting a wide net when pursuing an exit, an examination of other buyer types. I'll reference a few other prior webinars that I've done uh, that are in this series. So I encourage you to at some point go back and take a look at them. Okay, let's go over a quick agenda. We're gonna start by kind of recapping those two prior webinars. Uh, the first one I did was on financial buyers, but it was very much focused on private equity funds. And the second was on strategic buyers. And I'll give you kind of the directions of where to find those. They were very well received. I think I got two thumbs up. Uh, I think Rotten Tomatoes was in the mid nineties. So uh, yeah, I'd encourage you to go back and take a look at those. Uh, today we're gonna focus on actually some subcategories of the financial buyer uh, segment and that's independent sponsors and family offices. So starting with independent sponsors, we'll talk about you know, what are they? Who are they? What do they look like? So how do you identify them in the wild? How do they get their money? And then some pros and cons. And with family offices, we'll do the who and why as well, how they're different. And then we'll dive into some other aspects and make them a bit, a bit nuanced from the other categories. We'll wrap it up and then we'll take, if we have time, a question or two. Okay, let's get going. Okay, so let's recap the two prior webinars. Again, I encourage you to go back and, and take a look at those two. Uh, we did cover the two kind of broad categories of buyers, financial and strategic. Financial buyers are comprised of mostly private equity funds, but also family offices, independent sponsors, and venture funds. Venture funds aren't particularly relevant for this form, so we won't cover them, but they are part of the broad category. Strategic buyers are just operating companies, just like yourself. Uh, they may be a competitor, they may be, may be in your value chain. Uh, the key, at least in my view, is that there has to be some additional value beyond just combining the two income statements and balance sheets, some accretion beyond just the financial. And we'll talk a little more about that in the coming slides. We've covered these two broad categories in these prior webinars. I'm going to hint at where to find them uh, and make it really really, really clear, but on this one, we'll go a little deeper. Let's start with strategic buyers. Again, I think as a baseline, it's helpful to understand these broad categories so we can juxtapose these two subcategories against them. So strategic buyers, they create value when you combine the buyer and the seller, right? Beyond just combining the balance sheet. An income statement, they tend to be either competitors or someone in your value chain. You know, a great example, and I think I, I covered in the prior webinar, is back, I think back then we were having a real shortage of trying to get new cars. That was largely, obviously it was a human capital constraint. It was also a function of not being able to get enough chips. Uh, this is mid COVID and chip fabricators were focusing on the home office rather than folks like the car industry. So you couldn't get cars, right? But what if Ford or GM had at that point, maybe a year earlier, bought their own chip manufacturer? Right? They vertically integrated that part of their supply chain to mitigate supply chain risk. They may have been ahead of the curve. And when you know, COVID went down and the folks are struggling to get chips, they might have a, a you know, ready store of, of chips capable of, of you know, cranking out of cars. They would have a huge advantage over their competitors. Of course, there's a, still a human capital constraint, but that's an example of a strategic acquisition. Right? Another example would be if maybe you're a competitor, and you're eating into the market share of, of the incumbent, right? And you're doing something different. Maybe you've got a better sales force, maybe you have a, a more efficient delivery model, whatever it happens to be, that competitor might overpay for you because you are doing something that is a really an existential threat to their business. And they may overpay the above market to take you out, right? So that would also be a strategic acquisition. Okay, let's move on. Financial buyers. I'm going to breeze through this. There's a lot of information on this slide. It's really intended for you to take it away later and dive in more information that I usually put on a presentation slide, but I think this is actually useful. I did focus really on private equity funds at that point. 
Uh, I, don't, I covered briefly these two other subcategories. So private equity funds are pooled capital. They go out to a bunch of investors that are known as limited partners or LPs. They tend to be insurance companies, university endowments, pension funds, and to a lesser degree, high net worth individuals, ultra high net worth individuals. There's a time horizon. It's generally about 10 years. Sometimes it's a year or two extension on that to give them some flexibility on the back end. And they're measured in one of two ways. One is IRR, internal rate of return, or multiple uninvested capital, otherwise known as cash on cash return. That's how they're measured. Really, that's it. VCs have an almost identical model. Same thing, about 20% is kind of the minimum on an IRR basis uh, to get any sort of attention from investors. One of the key things about a private equity fund is they have their eyes on the exit before they make the acquisition, right? So they're already thinking about selling before they own the company. They make most of their money after they've They've sold the business, right? So they get a small fee along the way, about 2%, but most of their money comes in the form of carry interest, right? And that's basically once the investors get their money back, plus the, the fees that they paid along the way, that's the 2% of the 2 and 20 that I've referenced a few times. The LPs, which are the investors, get 80%, whereas the GP, which is the managers, get 20%. That's where most of their money actually comes from. I wouldn't expect, this is pretty key for most of our sellers, I wouldn't expect a long-term buy and hold strategy from any private equity fund. They are looking to sell in three to five years. That is just a, that's just a fact. Independent sponsors, and we'll cover that much deeper in this, in this webinar, they raise money on a deal by deal basis, right? They don't pool capital. Family offices, again, we'll go over that more in depth in this webinar. They take a private equity approach. They've got folks who typically have worked in private equity, but the capital comes from one or a few families, right? Single family offices versus multi-family offices. Uh, they're open to much longer indefinite, even hold periods. There's no time horizon at all stated in their mandate. Sometimes they'll hold it forever, you know, through multiple generations. And they also initially, especially invest in things that are aligned with how they generated their wealth, right? So, and I'll talk about this a little deeper, but they tend to only invest in things they truly understand and where they can add value beyond the check. And we'll cover all of this in more in depth in this presentation. Again, I referenced the two prior webinars that I did. And if you go to our website, which is benchmarkintl.com and scroll to the bottom of the homepage, under events, you see webinars. And I believe the two that I referenced are within the first five or six. So you'll be able to you know, get hours of enjoyment out of that. So enjoy, bring your popcorn and, uh, and feel free to ask us any questions. Give us a call. We're happy to, to field your questions. Okay, that's the prelim. Now we're into kind of the meat and potatoes of this webinar. I'm going to take a quick sip of coffee to get my voice back. This is how you know it's live, folks. Independent sponsors, what are they? Okay, as I mentioned, this is not pooled capital. They don't raise a fund. They go find a deal and then raise capital to fund that deal. It's a deal by deal basis. One key element that is actually a real positive for independent sponsors is that the financial backers, the folks who are writing the actual checks, have the ability to opt in or opt out of any specific investment. They're not riding along on things that they may not be interested in. They're really looking at each deal and deciding whether they want to be a part of that deal. So a pretty key uh, differentiator there. They also tend to view the world, these independent sponsors, very much like a private equity investor would. They don't tend to view the world like a founder would, generally. And some funds, especially now, and we'll go a little deeper in the coming slides, will partner with independent sponsors you know, the version that have, you know, really good experience can add some value. So we've seen that more and more in the last five or 10 years. Okay. Independent sponsors, when I started doing this at Benchmark about 10 years ago, we called them fundless sponsors. That's become a pejorative really of late, but the real, you know, the real origin of the name is not that these guys don't have any money. It's that they don't have a dedicated fund. 
but that word has changed from fund list to independent. So we call them independent sponsors to be respectful. One subcategory of this subcategory, a subcategory of independent sponsor is the search fund. Search funds are, not every independent sponsor is a search fund, but every search fund is an independent sponsor, if that makes sense. They almost always will take on a senior level role at the business. That's the end game here. They're looking to buy one business with someone else's money to run in a senior role, typically the CEO role. These folks tend to be more entrepreneurial. They really tend to be, you know, looking through a lens that's much more similar to the, the CEO or the founder of the target company, because uh, that's their orientation. And one other key uh, component here is that their search is often funded, right? So they'll get a year or two to go identify one business to buy and run, and the investors will pay them, you know, a nominal salary, nominal to them at least. It tends to be low six figures, it allows them to pay pay their mortgage and some of their basic expenses and will pull them away from lucrative corporate jobs to go take a run at, at running a business. Those same investors tend to be the investors who will fund the acquisition, obviously. And for a search fund, and we'll go much deeper on how these folks get paid generally, but for search funds, the economics tend to be more performance-based uh, than what you see in the larger subcategory of independent sponsors. There's generally no deal fee or closing fee when it comes to search funds. They make their money elsewhere. Okay. So who are they and why are they? Uh, so who are they? Many of them come from private equity and some are turned off by some of the logistics of managing a dedicated fund. There's more than just flying around and, and giving out money to buy companies. There's a back end, there's a, there's a management piece that can be you know, procedural and administrative, that's not a lot of fun. Also every three to five years, these guys are raising additional funds. In the midst of deploying capital or raising the next fund, it's not a lot of fun, it can be distracting, right? And often these guys will see, guys and gals will see uh, really interesting deals that uh, they can't take a swing at because it falls outside of the mandate, generally from a size perspective. So they see really interesting deals that they're excited about, but they can't do those deals because it doesn't align with the mandate of the fund, right? So they tend to, they tend to get pulled into independent sponsor work because they see an opportunity and they can't take advantage of that opportunity within the framework of their existing fund. Now, some of these folks are, are you know, less interesting. Uh, they're just trying to buy themselves a job with someone else's money. Now, search funds are a part of this category and, that would be the good half, right? The folks who actually have true access to capital and have a view. They, they, they're trying to buy a company to run, they've got expertise, that's, that's great. But there are other independent sponsors that really bring you other value other than you know, they're trying to buy a job, right? And that's not, that's not the category you're looking for. Now, some of these folks, and this is kind of the worst of them, they're just buy-side brokers in disguise. All they do is they will lock up your deal They'll get it under letter of intent, which has exclusivity. Generally, there'll be a longer period where most periods are about 90 days in deals. Theirs might be 120 if they ask for 180 days. They'll get you locked up in a, in a letter of intent and then go try and find the buyer, the actual buyer. If they manage to find the buyer, which generally is a, maybe a one in 10 shot, that buyer you know, may love your company, but probably doesn't love the deal, right? Because this independent sponsor has likely bid up the value beyond what is market, well beyond what is market. They're gonna retrade the deal. It's not really a retrade. It's the first time they've looked at it. They may wanna buy it, but not at the structure and price that the independent sponsor had struck with you. So now you're starting over. You're basically starting over and you've been off market for four or five months, potentially. It's not, it's not the end game you're looking for. Now, there are some others in this ecosystem that actually are, are really useful. Uh, there are, you get these folks who spent decades in corporate and worked their way up close to the top and really are missing the days when they're working in a small business, right? And, and they were looking to leverage their expertise, their talent, their networks, their experience, and apply that to a small business. So some of those folks, they come with their own money, great networks, great expertise, and access to more money. That's a great version of an independent sponsor, right? They tend to be very narrowly focused in what they're going after, the kinds of companies that they ran in the past, right? 
So that's another version. So let's talk a little bit about why they exist. So the best of them are attracted to the model, right? There are some, some issues with the private equity model. One of the big ones is there's pressure to deploy this capital. The limited partners want their money put to work and then they want it back with a nice return, right? So if you're a fund and you're taking a lot of swings and you're not connecting, it's competitive out there. There are a lot of you know, buyers out there chasing not as many deals. So sometimes a fund is just gonna miss out over and over and if you're early in your fund and you're not connecting on any deals, you get the pressure to deploy. And you can make some bad decisions. You can buy some suboptimal companies or perhaps overpay for companies because of that pressure, right? That doesn't exist with an independent sponsor, obviously. They don't have that pressure. They fund deal by deal. Now, one other really interesting aspect is that you can create what we would call a bespoke investor pool for each deal. Right. So if you're one of the independent sponsors that has really good access to capital, maybe you have six or eight investors, you can go to the two that make the most sense for that deal. Right. Rather than just going to a blanket of, of 10 investors, you go to the ones that make the most sense, ones who add value beyond the money. Right. I'll say this probably again later on in the presentation, but there's different kinds of capital. There's financial capital, there's intellectual capital, there's relationship capital. The one that's most fungible interchangeable is financial capital. If someone wants to hand you a million dollars, right? And there's another person who wants to hand you a million dollars and they have it in their hands, not in their hands, on the ground, right? We're talking about a million dollars in cash. It's $10,000 bills. You're going to take the one that has something beyond the cash to offer you, right? They have a network. They've got access to, you know, a really good Rolodex. They can bring good board members on. They can you know, find that next national sales manager, help you scale. That's what you're looking for, right? So this is more than just the money. And the ones that you're looking for are the ones that can add value beyond the money. And you get that opportunity as an independent sponsor if you have access to, for, to different, different uh, investors in your roster. So one of the also positive aspects is in a fund environment, if you have 50 investors, they all get dragged along, whether they like that deal or not, right? Uh, in this model, they only invest in deals that they're excited to be a part of, right? They get to opt in or opt out of deals. That's a pretty important component. Now, the one other version is the, the kid out of B school, out of business school. Typically, it's Harvard or Stanford. And they're trying to leverage their alumni network to buy themselves a job. They don't want to go work for McKinsey or an operating company. They want to just start at the top as CEO. And their view is that, hey, I went to Harvard. I can leverage that network. There's a lot of money in that network, which is true. Problem is a lot of folks have tried this. Some have succeeded. Most have failed. If the only value you're bringing to the table is that you went to Harvard and you can tap that network, uh, tread lightly. If that's all they have, uh, that, that there's got to be more to it, right? You know, one other positive aspect is that they can focus on opportunities that may not get the attention of traditional private equity funds. We hinted at this earlier, but there are deals that for whatever reason, it might be because there's a lot of customer concentration, there are heavy burdens of um, set aside work that private equity funds and even strategics can't wrap their arms around. And you might have somebody as an independent sponsor that has worked you know, has solved these problems in the past and they can get comfortable. Uh, maybe they've got another investment perhaps um, when put side by side with your company mitigates that customer concentration immediately, right? So there, there is a vital, it's, they can serve a vital um, service in this ecosystem. So there's, there are some, uh, some benefits certainly for, uh, for their existence. We'll talk more about that in a bit here. So how do you spot one of these folks in the wild? Well, the best of them uh, tend to be very, very transparent uh, about who they are. They'll tell you flat out, like we don't have a pool of capital that we're drawing down. We're not a traditional fund. We raise money deal by deal. Here are our investors, I'll name them, and I'll put you in contact with them. That's the best of the best, right? They're not embarrassed by being an independent sponsor. They chose this route, right? So the best of them, have no problem announcing to the world that they are not a fund, that they are an independent sponsor. 
right? These folks tend to only have a couple of people on the team versus private equity. You'll see a pretty robust and deep team from junior folks all the way up to senior people. Independent sponsors generally only have a couple of folks and typically they're at the same level, managing director level or above, right? Okay. There are others, and these are the folks that you want to try to avoid. They'll just lie to you. They're going to say they're a private equity. I've had some tell me they're going to stroke a check out of their fund and they're also going to fund the debt. They had neither, right? They had to go out and shop the deal and go find the debt, right? So they might lie to you. So a lot of questions you can ask them. You're probably better off hiring someone like me, but you can ask them these questions. Do you have a pool of committed capital? What's the model? Is it traditional two and 20? 2% management fee, 20% of the carry. Look at their website. Most funds have a pretty robust website. You'll see level, levels of employees from junior to senior. You'll see analysts, associates, VPs, managing directors, and you'll also see an investor login button, almost always in the top right section, right? Click on that. If, it's, if there's actually a button there, that's a good sign, click on it. Sometimes it's a button that doesn't go anywhere. If it goes somewhere and it's a protected backend with login credentials and encrypted, you've got a pretty good indication that these guys have money or access to it, right? It's a pretty, pretty easy way to spot them. Some of these folks are, again, they couldn't quite crack that private equity code. Now folks in private equity are very high functioning people. They went to the best colleges, the best B schools, and were the top students at these schools. There's probably one job for every hundred candidates that want that job, right? So it's really hard to break your way in. And some of these folks actually got in, but they flamed out. They didn't quite make it, right? So while there are some that chose this route, there are others who are there because they want to act like a private equity fund, but they don't, they don't actually have the fund behind them. So the key, and this is always the key as a business operator, you've done this your whole career, trust your instincts, right? If your BS detector goes off, listen to it. If you're skeptical, ask them for support letters. A support letter is a specific letter from a specific funder. If it's equity, it's one of their investors and it's gotta be in support of your deal, not deals generally. Ask them for a support letter, really, really critical. It's a great way to identify those that have access to money versus those that say they do. Okay. How do they get their money? We've, we've covered this to some degree. To some degree, you see high net worth individuals, the ultra high net worths. They're really tough to get on your roster. You know, you, you can't get an audience with these people. You really have to already know them. Now, if you have access to someone like this already, then sure, they, they may want to fund your deal. Perhaps you did a deal with these people in the past. Maybe you're a private equity person who created wealth for this person by investing into their company. And when it sold later, they made a ton of money, right? So those folks tend to be you're pretty grateful. So that can happen, but it's, it's not a huge segment for independent sponsors. Family offices though can be. Uh, so the better independent sponsors often will go to family offices to get the capital, right? And for, for a family office, you can see some synergy there with the right independent sponsor. And frankly, they don't have extensive business development you know, arms and networks, right? They don't have a huge BD arm. So these fund sponsors, independent sponsors can be really great um, external business development arms for, uh, for family offices. Sometimes private equity funds will back independent sponsors. And we'll talk a bit about that later, but you know, we've seen there's a lot of money out there chasing probably too few deals. So, you know, they've, they've had to change their model a bit to get more competitive. You know, I would say five or six years ago, I'd have private equity funds in my office and they would say, hey, we only do majority deals. And in the last few years, we've seen they've changed their tune a bit. They've had to start doing minority deals, some, some of them. They've had to start backing the independent sponsors who until maybe five or six years ago, they saw it as competition, right, as a nuisance. So it, it's, it's definitely an evolving, uh, an evolving ecosystem. We're seeing more and more these funds backing independent sponsors. Some of these guys have money, right? The, we talked about a couple of different versions, people who are already successful, want to just want to you know, move back to a smaller business that really has the ability to grow, make an impact. 
They use some of their own money. Often they'll use senior debt. Even in this environment where interest rates are incredibly high, uh, it's still, the cost of debt is still much cheaper than the cost of equity. Cost of equity for these, these folks is in the 20s. The cost of debt is still sub 10 generally. So it still makes sense to, to use senior for sure. Sometimes they're gonna to go to get second lien debt, mezzanine debt, it's higher, higher interest rates, but doesn't tend to have um, you know, any sort of payment along the way. Maybe it's only interest only, maybe it's entirely a balloon, right? So there's some cash flow advantages there. And then more often than not, it's a combination of the above, right? So they might have a family office or two that's backing them, plus maybe some, some debt or some, they'll throw in some of their own cash some version of that. We often will see a combination of the above financings. Okay, it's a little smaller. So how do they get paid? We talked about this just a little bit. One of the, the predominant ways these folks make their money is through a deal bonus, right? Um, so it'll be low single digit percentage up to typically a cap. These people aren't making millions of dollars on, you know, on large deals. And in that way, it really does mimic a buy side broker, right? They get a success fee. It's almost like an introductory fee. That's it. They're making an introduction and they walk away, right? But there is a cap. There's only, there's only so much value there that the actual buyer is willing to pay. Now, some of these folks take on like legitimate jobs. Sometimes it's the CEO role or some other leadership role, in which case they'll get a salary and maybe even uh, participate in the options pool or profits interest pool, right? So there's a way to make money that way. And the biggest way that these people can make money is through in an upside event, right? So it's sold later for more money than it was purchased for is through promote or promoted interest. It's the same thing as carried interest for private equity funds. Basically once the investors get their money back, plus any of the fees along the way, they share on the upside and that can be negotiated. It's, there's no standard. Uh, sometimes they get a accelerated interest initially up to a, a sort of a benchmark and then it slows down, but that's the largest way for them to make money in an upside event. Obviously in a downside event or a neutral event where it's sold for what either less than or the same as it was purchased for, uh, promote is, is essentially moot. But that's how they tend to get paid. Some versions of those, some combination of those. Pros and cons, we've gone through a few of these, right? Um, there are probably less pros than, than cons, but uh, the pros are, you really do have great alignment with the investor base, right? These investors have, have agency. They have the ability to make a decision on their own rather than just sort of riding along with the private equity management team. So it, that's, in that way, it's a real pro, right? If you're a, you know, a very successful person that wants to participate, in private equity like deals and you don't want to be invested in a blind pool if you invested in actual stocks versus mutual funds maybe that's your orientation uh, it makes more sense perhaps to back an independent sponsor so there's no pressure to deploy capital there's no money burning a hole in their pockets as i said they invest deal by deal so they raise money for each each deal individually and they don't have this pressure to deploy capital as quickly as possible. They also, another pretty significant pro for the entire ecosystem is that they can serve as an external business development arm for both private equity funds and family offices. So obviously they're providing a service for these two uh, investor types, right? Because these folks don't have hugely robust uh, networks of, of BD folks, especially family offices. And private equity funds are desperate to ensure that they see every deal possible, right? So they provide a real service for these buyers, but also they're providing a great service for sellers like yourselves, because it's definitely possible that your deal finds its way into the right person's hands, the right ultimate buyer because of an independent sponsor, right? So they provide a real service in this ecosystem, but there are some cons. Right, so we do attract folks to this segment who really couldn't make it or crack the nut in private equity. It's really hard to get in, it's very lucrative, and a lot of folks wanna make their way into that market. So if you can't get there, you kind of pretend that you're a private equity fund, you do get folks like that. It doesn't really require any of their own capital. It's certainly helpful, but it's not required because 
Generally, you're using other people's money. Those without access to capital are the ones to really watch out for because if you get something under letter as an independent sponsor, you're going to shop your, the deal around to people who can fund it. And those who really don't have great ready access to capital might show it to 50 or 100 different shops. That can really bog you down as a seller. Uh, you've got to focus on your business. This is an aside. This is not a full-time job for you. Even with someone representing you, you're going to get a ton of information requests because each time this essentially a buy side broker, right? This independent sponsor that's shopping this deal around gets a different question from one of the potential ultimate buyers. They're going to send them to you, right? There's probably 80 or 90% overlap with these questions. But that 10 or 20% coming from dozens and dozens of buyers can be really debilitating, really distracting. It's really important that you have somebody on your side who can help sort of filter out these requests, put together a repository of commonly asked questions so that you're not just inundated uh, with information requests. Okay, so let's just wrap it up here on independent sponsors. What are the takeaways? Well, as we said, they do invest on a deal by deal basis. They don't have a pool of capital they can draw down at request. They also may not have access to capital at all. They may, they may not, right? Because of that, transparency is really, really key. The ones who do have access to capital are gonna show you the, the, that pathway. They have no problem making introductions. You can have phone calls with their investors, not a problem. The ones who don't are gonna Hem and haw, and you won't have any access because the folks don't exist, right? So really, it's, those questions that we brought up earlier are really, really key. That said, they do plug a gap, or they can, right? And they do attack deals that some just wouldn't touch, right? And in that way, they, they, they provide a vital service. So, you know, while we have to be mindful of some of the downfalls, there, there are some upsides of having these people in the market. Trust your senses, trust your spidey sense. If it's tingling and there's probably a reason for it, you've got good instincts, you've made it this far. Trust your instincts. Uh, and you know, obviously, again, hire somebody to do that work for you. Okay, so we're gonna pivot here to the second half of the presentation and it's focused on family offices. Family offices are obviously distinct from uh, independent sponsors. We talked a little about them because they do tend to work together on occasion. But let's start by talking about what they are. So what are they? They are a professional team uh, managing the money of one or perhaps several very, very wealthy families. So they tend to be uh, a team um, of generally private equity folk, at least at the very top of the team, with some young people doing a lot of the heavy lifting, just like in a private equity fund. They also have different arms, right? So they probably have a team that's doing public market investments and others, and I'll, I'll go deeper on that in a a slide that follows here. The way they had access to private market investments historically had been as LPs in private equity funds. And we'll talk a little bit about why that you know, they moved away from that. So rather than just being an LP and paying heavy fees and not having any sort of control over the deployment of your capital, they've decided to make direct investments into private companies with their own team. They generally have some good private equity experience on that team. Perhaps even we've seen the sons and daughters of the founder you know, working their way up through private equity and then coming to help run the family office. Now, there aren't very many of these. Um, now, they're a very recent development. The, the first of the family offices in the US go date back almost 150 years back to the Vanderbilts and the Roosevelts. But for the most part, most of the ones that are around today have really emerged since the year 2000. There were about 3,000 family offices in the United States and compared to 20,000 private equity funds, and that's directly from the SEC. Uh, and of the 3,000, uh, about two-thirds of them have uh, emerged in this millennium, so relatively early in their life cycle. And, you know, a lot of changes. We're probably in the maybe the third or fourth inning uh, of this, uh, of what they're going to look like here. So a lot of changes, and, and really, I think we'll see a, a bit of a disruption um, and I'll talk about that a little later in the private equity world because of that. These folks don't tend to publicize uh, their existence. You kind of have to find them. And you know, this is another reason why you want to have somebody on your side kind of driving, uh, driving this process for you.
Okay. Why do they exist? Well, they serve really as a, a one-stop shop for the wealthiest of families. And these aren't folks that are worth a few million dollars. These are worth families worth a billion dollars. They generally have a hundred million or more in assets committed to investment, right? So these are uber wealthy folks and they do kind of manage more than just money for these people. So uh, when I say one-stop shop, I mean, they're handling all of their tax issues, tax planning, trusts and estates, wills. They're handling uh, their legal matters generally. They're kind of that uh, clearing house for all big decisions for the family. Now they're doing deployments of, of capital in the public markets. They're doing you know, work in terms of real estate investments, any sort of other investments that they're making into, into hedge, and sometimes into venture. They also have an arm typically that does direct investment into private companies. And that's the version that we're talking about here. So it really allows them to target their investments. We talked about investing into a pool, right? Through private equity. There's very little control that you can exert as a wealthy investor into a private equity fund, right? You can get direct exposure through sidecar investments sometimes, but generally you're just riding along with the rest of the investors and you're sort of ceding control of the decision-making to the GP. These folks are type A folks. So, you know, they don't like to see control to anyone for anything that involves money. So, you know, because of that, we've seen this category really explode in, in, in the recent years. Also, frankly, it's much cheaper. It's just much cheaper to do it on your own. You can raise your own team if you're good at it and get by with maybe half, half the out-of-pocket expense, the two and 20 model. Uh, we're seeing that, that evolve already. I think we'll see some real changes here in the coming 10 or 20 years because of uh, what family offices have been doing. You're pulling money away from private equity investment um, and competing with them. And when you put them side by side, you see some real differences. Now, we tend to see, especially with our clients, uh, our clients are really uh, looking for a great caretaker of their legacy, as well as a, a way to unlock and monetize their life's work. So oftentimes we'll see that these wealthy families and family offices as being maybe a better fit for them in terms of their time horizons. There's really no pressure for a family office, and we'll get into that a bit more, to exit a business, right? Uh, they're happy to enjoy the ride and grow the business and enjoy the cash flow. And most of our clients are not really excited about potentially being sold more than once over the course of a few years. So they are they're definitely someone that you to consider uh, when you're going through a process. Make sure you call someone that knows what they're doing. That's a theme. We'll talk about that a lot. Okay, so how are they different? Well, they're, if you talk to any of them, the first thing they will say is that they are patient capital, right? Patient as compared to private equity. And that's true, they are. Uh, they don't have the kind of time horizons that you'll see in private equity. And, you know, for good reasons. Not, there's no constraint on time horizon at all, right? There's no pressure to return capital in five years, three years, 10 years. There's no pressure to return capital at any point, right? They aren't thinking about the exit before they invest. And if you watch the private equity webinar I did, that's absolutely the lens that private equity funds look at deals through because they, the only way they make money is by selling the company that they bought, right? Whereas that's not the lens at all that family offices look through. There's no pressure to deploy capital either, right? They don't have money burning a hole in their pocket. Again, when you're fundraising, you have to show that you know how to put money to work and that you're really good at getting a return out of that. That's not the mandate at a, at a family office. It's the family's money. They might be very comfortable just creating great stores of cash flow every year through all their investments, replenishing the money that they put into new companies. Uh, that and they can do that just on and off, right? It creates these, these this great cash flow, these great assets that they're happy to to ride it out for as long as possible, right? They also aren't distracted by fundraising. You know, funds even with a ten year useful life are out fundraising three, four, five years into it. Generally, not five, less than five, right? And that can be a real challenge. Um, in certain markets, it can be more challenging, even for a successful fund, right? So. You know, these folks are supposed to be full-time investors, but also 
serve on boards, right? They might be on four or five boards at once of companies that they're operating, that they're buying. So this is a real distraction from their day to day. And you know, the difference is with a family office, there's no capital raise. This is evergreen capital. It's there, it's there to deploy, and there's no need to go out and look for more money. When they make an investment, it tends to be, as we've seen, kind of very cash rich, a higher percentage of cash close than you see in other, uh, other kinds of buyers and generally less structure. You're not seeing as many earnouts and seller notes. They also tend to use leverage uh, less aggressively than especially private equity funds. They've got plenty of money uh, and they, they think like operators, they think like founders. And because of that, they're, they tend to be debt averse more so than, than private equity funds that, you know, while they're not financial engineers anymore, they are looking at, at you know, the cost of capital um, really closely. Their weighted average cost of capital is really, really important to them because it helps to drive their return. So, you know, a fund, a private equity fund will use leverage much more so than you will see with strategics and with family offices. So that, that's a key, a key differentiator. They also tend to think like founders because they are, right? They, they sold the business uh, usually for a lot of money, but they ran that business sometimes for generations. And because of that, they just don't think like financial sponsors. They're not private equity folks. They don't think like them. Now the managers that are running, you know, running the family office for them certainly came from private equity almost always. But the family and the family is key here. They're not wired that way. They're wired very differently. They don't think about IRR internal rate of return. They're not looking about multiple of invested capital. That's not how they look at things. Of course, they want to make sure it's a sound investment financially, but there are other things that will drive them more so than, you know, that near term return, that three to five year return that may not be on the radar at all. They're looking for long term. Maybe it's something that, that funds a passion project, right? Maybe they have a passion for the environment. They're looking to buy something that has that, that ties in there, right? They're looking to create cash flow. They want to make a good investment. But it also you know, dovetails with some personal interests of, of their own. So, you know, we see that in family offices, it's their money. They don't have a fiduciary responsibility to anyone other than themselves, uh, whereas private equity has to make really clinical decisions. So it's a real differentiator there. They also may be more interested, they certainly are more interested in taking on the risk of concentrating their investments into a select few companies. Private equity funds do not do that. Most investors don't do that. You know, most of you probably invest heavily into mutual funds. You don't want to be stock pickers, right? Leave it up to others to make that call for you. Why not just diversify? Buy a mutual fund, right? Versus picking stocks. It probably moderates your upside, right? But it also probably does the same for your downside. So if you hire somebody and you know a team of, of investors uh, through a private equity fund to make those investments for you, you're going to get a diversified portfolio. Uh, versus making one or two investments in the select companies and taking a bigger swing. But these folks made their money that way, right? This is how they made their wealth, by investing into a single company, all of their resources, all their time and efforts. So they've got that risk tolerance that you don't see with other classifications of buyers. Let me take a quick sip, get my voice back. Okay, family offices, let's talk about how they fund their deals. I think you probably know that by now, but we'll go a little deeper here. So it comes from one person, one family, or sometimes multiple families. These are entrepreneurs. They made a lot of money selling a business. Now, that business that they ran and sold typically informs their investment strategy. So if you take someone who perhaps had a OEM automotive manufacturing business, right? So they sold, maybe they're Detroit based, they sold to the big three and they made a billion dollars on the sale. It happens, it sounds like a lot of money, it is a lot of money, but it happens fairly regularly. Those folks, especially initially, are gonna find deals that are very similar, right? So they're gonna invest in automotive manufacturers, right? Probably OEM manufacturers, not even aftermarket. That's probably how they're gonna start. Over time, they'll get a little less discipline. They're more comfortable and start migrating out a little bit, right? So they'll start narrow because that's where they add value, right? That's how they made their money. They've got all the relationships. They know access points. They can pick up the phone and call Jim Hackett, CEO of Ford. They can get him on the phone, right? They, they have access to people, 
the talent. Uh, they, they know how these markets work. They know, uh, they know it's kind of the secret sauce. And because of that, that's their value add. Something more than money. That's the piece beyond the financial capital that they bring. So they invest in stuff that they understand and typically it's the source of their wealth, which makes obviously total sense. As I said earlier, financial capital of all the various kinds of capital is the most fungible, right? It's interchangeable. You don't really care in terms of where the money came from. It's the other part, the intellectual capital, obviously uh, more than anything is not fungible. You know, the insight that one investor can bring the doors that they can open is different than the, than the next person. Right. And that's why they focus that way. These folks are harder to find. They really are. They don't have an aggressive deal sourcing arm like you find in private equity. You know, I get yelled at by private equity funds when they didn't see a deal of ours. Uh, these guys really want to see everything. Where family offices are a little different. Uh, they really are much more selective, sometimes too selective, right? So they don't have access like others. It, it's a bit of a challenge for them. That's why they do fund, as I said earlier, independent sponsors from time to time because they can really serve as an outsourced business development arm. So that's a pretty interesting component. They do club deals too. So you will see two family offices combining to do a deal, right? Take that example that I gave you of the family who made their money selling their manufacturer uh, of auto parts, OEM auto parts. Maybe over the course of time, they've gotten a little more comfortable and have strayed a little bit from that very narrow mandate. And they come across a deal that is software for um, car manufacturers, right? Maybe for cars. And they're really interested. They're really interested, but they don't understand the software piece. They might partner with another family office that they know well, maybe from the golf course, who knows? Maybe from the billionaire jet setting club. And they do a deal with those folks that maybe got their money in software, vertical market software, perhaps, right? You put these two together and you have real synergy and they can really add significant value, probably in a way that no other, you know, no other buyer possibly could. Uh, private equity, strategic or otherwise. So, you know, we'll see club deals fairly often with multiple family offers, offices. Uh, these, again, as I mentioned earlier, these are type A folks. These are really, really successful people. So I wouldn't count on winning a negotiation with these folks. You're not gonna move these people dramatically off of their number, off of their structure. You know, whereas private equity will come in and sometimes they'll give you an offer that's meaningfully lower than they're willing to go to. Right? These are professional negotiators, just like we are. So they'll move, right? They come in at a certain level, understanding that they're going to have to move up, maybe adapt the structure a bit, come off of their numbers. And you know, that's just kind of, those are table stakes. That's par for the course, they get it. Whereas family offices are more likely to come in with an offer that they're willing to do and may not move meaningfully from that, right? So uh, don't take it the wrong way if they're not particularly excited about moving off of their uh, their first offer, at least aggressively. I mentioned this before, they are absolutely disrupting private equity. It, in some regards, it is a better model. They have a better pitch for a lot of the sellers out in the lower middle market, and they may add more value, right? It's just not as many of them out there, and they're not as aggressive. So, But over time, we, I do see this as being a real disruptive force in the, in the private company sale process. Okay. Takeaways for family offices. We've said this a few times, but it's really kind of a critical component. They get their money from one or multiple families, right? Folks who are incredibly wealthy and they deploy the capital through a family office. They're incredibly patient. They're just very patient. There's no pressure to deploy or return capital. These folks tend to be very excited about the cash flow profile of the business going forward. They also stick to the knitting. That's an old term I learned, I think my freshman year in college, 116 years ago. It's really about sticking to what got you there, right? Not veering off into wild passion issues, getting into software when you're you know, a manufacturer, those kinds of things. They focus on what got them there, especially initially. Over time, if they've been around 10 years, sometimes they get really, really good at, at making picks and and getting really good advisors who can help you understand the nuances of different markets and they become almost like a de facto private equity fund. But in the first five or six years, they tend to be very, very disciplined and focus on what got them there. They're also very conservative. 
uh, conservative in, in every possible way, but especially in the use of leverage. Uh, they, but they also will come with pretty cash rich offers. So while they're not using a lot of debt, they are going to give you a lot of cash, at least as a percentage of the overall deal. And they tend to be pretty tough on the negotiations. They think more like business owners than they do investors because well, that's what they are. They are business owners. They're not professional investors, even though that's what they've moved into. And they're pretty scarce. They're hard to find. Uh, they're probably the hardest to find of, of any buyer category. When we meet new potential sellers, a lot of times they'll come with an offer, what they think is an offer, and it's generally from an independent sponsor. Uh, those are easy to find, right? Family offices are a lot harder to find. So that's one of the key components. Those are the takeaways for family offices. And we're just wrapping up here. So just to summarize what we've covered, we started by referencing the two prior webinars that I've done in this buyer series, right? The first was financial buyers really focused on private equity. And the second one I did was on strategic buyers. Again, you can find both of those on our website. I encourage you to go back and, and take a look at if you can get through this one, uh, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to the other two. We talked about two subcategories of the financial buyers today. So we talked about independent sponsors and we talked about family offices. So independent sponsors, they do take a private equity approach, but without committed capital. They don't have pooled funds. They do come in all shapes and sizes. They get the bad and ugly, as we say. Some are very, very good. They're there for the right reasons and they have great access to capital and they add tremendous value, right? Others are not that. Others are essentially uh, just buy side advisors, buy side brokers in disguise. And what's really, really critical is you have to find, uh, find a way to identify which is which, right? Some of the better versions are former partners at private equity funds or former corporate executives, right? They both have access to capital. They both can add value beyond just the cash. Um, but funding is absolutely critical, especially with this group, less so than that with say a private equity fund. Those guys have access to capital. It's in a fund. Family offices have access to capital. Independent sponsors, you really have to, to be pretty rigorous asking them the key questions. And this is where it really pays to have somebody on your side asking those questions for you. Now they can either fill an incredibly vital gap that's un underserved, you know, for companies that just don't find the right partner, but they also can tie up a really good business uh, under letter for a long time while they look for the ultimate buyer. So really, really critical that you, you take the precautionary steps in the front end. Again, if you have somebody working for you, they really understand how to identify these guys and identify whether they're the good kind or the bad kind. Now, family offices are very different, right? Uh, they have absolute access to capital because it's their own, right? We tend to see a lot of single family offices and, and some of them are, are sort of a, a, a mashup of multiple families. But the one thing they have in common is they have incredible stores of wealth. So funding is not an issue here. They're incredibly patient capital. There's no pressure to deploy or to monetize, right? So there's no pressure to sell. They tend to hold. There tends to be no end game here other than to keep the company until, you know, until the next generation takes over and, and keep going. So family offices are protecting uh, the, the wealth of these families. Their goal is to protect first and then grow second, right? Because they want to create generational wealth. They don't want this money to go away in, in one or two generations. They want it to, to last to the end of time. Right? So they invest in what they know. That's one of the reasons why they do that is to protect their, their money. They leverage their talents and their expertise and their, in their history. They tend to think more like founders and entrepreneurs than they do private equity investors because they are, they are founders. This is what they do. They think very differently. And it's really, that's a real key differentiator between private equity and family offices. But all of these can prove really vital in a process. Some companies really should partner with an independent sponsor because they just make the most sense, right? And you'll find that out through your, your own process, which makes the most sense for you. But when you're going through that process and talking to strategics and talking to private equity funds and maybe some family offices and probably some independent sponsors, you'll find out which one has the best, you know, the best story 
the one that makes the most sense to your business, the one that's going to be the great caretaker of your legacy. It's not just about monetizing a life's work. It's also about finding the right partner going forward. So it's really critical that you, you leverage all of these folks in a sale process. Just to wrap it up, to sort of reiterate what I said just, just moments ago, keep an open mind. Don't try to pick the buyer before you start, right? Because you might fall in love with a different subcategory that you never thought you'd consider. You might find the right buyer that wasn't what you expected, but more, more important than anything is to get the right person driving this process for you because you really have to separate the wheat from the chaff. There's a lot of chaff out there. You really want to find the person who is the right caretaker of your legacy. Benchmark is here. We're ready. We think we're the right partner for you. Please give us a call and you know, we'll stand ready and looking forward to working with you. So I got this question recently. It was submitted to me via email. And it's a good question. I think it's pretty topical for what we're talking about today. So why would I even consider a fundless sponsor? It doesn't sound like they're as good as other buyer types like strategic and private equity. And it's a good question, right? We did cover independent sponsors here in depth and there were probably more downsides than upsides, uh, guilty. But it's really, really important. I think I touched on this a little bit at the very back end of the presentation to consider every possible buyer, open it up as broadly as possible because you know the person that has the story that matches the most with where you, you see this business going, going forward, might be an independent sponsor, right? It may not be a private equity fund, right? Who will have a, their own view, right? Who will make decisions more short-term than long-term. It may not be a strategic who actually might impact your culture, might make you change the way you do things, which is maybe not a great fit for you. Maybe it's not a great fit for a family office for whatever reason, but maybe that independent sponsor comes in and has a vision that aligns very closely with yours. And perhaps that person also has ready access to capital. So again, it really comes down to what's the best fit for your company. Some great companies are sold to independent sponsors every day, right? So I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't worry about that negative connotation, right? As long as you have access to a really good sell side advisor who can tell you what version of fundless sponsor or independent sponsor these guys are, and they can get a deal done, that may be the best fit for you. Again, we talked about who's the best caretaker of your legacy and who can get a deal done. You're trying to monetize your life's work, right? If it's a fundless sponsor, independent sponsor, private equity, strategic, just be open because that might be your best partner. Okay. I think this is a logical stopping point. I want to thank you again for coming to our third in our series of buyer types. I think this is probably the last one, unless I can think of another. Uh, I'll see you the next time on a different topic. Thank you.